Uh, alrighty, so yeah, uh, as Leo said, I'm Andrew McCluskey, and I work at Data61 uh, as part of the Queensland Functional Programming Lab, and I'm going to talk about property-based state machine testing. So the what and the why. Um, I'm going to assume and hope that we're all pretty familiar with the basics of property-based testing. Uh, so here's the kind of canonical example of the reverse of a reverse of a list is uh, the original list. Uh, but what about testing properties uh, more of like a, a system level? So um, we might want to test that data we've submitted to a web application comes back um, the same as we put it in. We might want to ensure that our uniqueness constraints hold. Um, and we might want to check that our authentication is doing what it should. So given our uh, property-based testing tools in the small, like testing our reverse function, it's not necessarily immediately obvious how we might be able to use these property-based testing tools in the large. But we have state machine testing, which I'm going to talk to you about today. Uh, so the plan from here, I'm going to give a very quick introduction to state machines. Uh, we're going to have a look at property-based testing for state machines using the Hedgehog library. And then we're going to jump into some examples. So state machines. Uh, this is about the simplest state machine you'll find. It's uh, one of the examples from Wikipedia, still and straight from there. So a state machine has states, as you might expect. So this is a state machine for a turnstile. Uh, it can be either locked or unlocked. It has an initial state, which is marked by this uh, filled-in black circle. And it has inputs. So if we have a locked turnstile and we put a coin in, it becomes unlocked. If we push the unlocked turnstile, it becomes locked again. I'm also going to guess that most of you aren't writing software that models turnstiles. Uh, so what else can we model as a state machine? Uh, games make use of state machines. Um, hopefully some of you are writing games. It sounds fun. Um, routing, so the internet uses state machines. And what we're going to talk about today, web applications. They can be thought of as state machines as well. So what does a web application look like as a state machine? So our states will be... Uh, the states of the various states of the database and any in-memory stuff that we're storing. The inputs will be HTTP requests, so when we send a request to a web application, often we're hoping that its state will change somehow. And the initial state will be the application before we've actually sent any requests, so empty database, all that sort of stuff. So the web application we're going to talk about today is called Leaderboard. Um, it's something that we've been playing with the Data61 is kind of more of a testing ground than a finished application. Um, so uh, the idea is that eventually it will keep track of game scores and player ratings. We're pretty big fans of table tennis at uh, QFPL. So the API, um, we're just going to look at the player registration uh, API today. Uh, so the first input in end point we have is register first. So this is used when the application's first started. Um, we can register our first user. So it's basically the first person in who registers, they become the admin uh, user. Uh, after that, we can register subsequent users, but we can only do that if we're um, an administrator. Uh, we have a me endpoint, which just retrieves the player information for the player who's submitting the request. So again, requires authentication. And we have a player account, which is a public um, endpoint. So anyone can hit this and get back account of players. So there are some properties we might want to test um, for this API. We might want to check that we can only register um, our first user once, right? Makes sense. Uh, we might also want to check that our player account matches the number of successful registrations. And we also want to check that the data we've put in for our players matches um, what we get back. So that brings us to state machine testing. So the kind of elevator pitch or the big picture of state machine testing is that we have a state machine to model our application and its state. We randomly generate inputs and then execute those inputs like we do with property-based testing. And then we update our model of the application state locally. And then we check that our model agrees with reality. So we make our assertions about the world. And now enter the hedgehog. <laughs> so, uh, as you'd expect, we're talking about state machines. Hedgehog uh, requires that we have a type to um, capture our state. Um, in this case, we're just wrapping up a Boolean value, but things will get more interesting later. Um, you also notice that this type is parameterized by this type constructor V, and we're going to uh, willfully ignore that for now. We will get back to it, though. 
Um, uh, so as we saw from our state machine models before, we also need some inputs. Uh, so in the case of this application, some examples of the play account. Um, so this is just a nullary constructor. Um, we make the request, we get back a account value. When we want to register our first player, uh, we need some registration information. So that's an argument to this input. And finally, when we want to register subsequent users, we need an administrator token and we need that registration information. Um, and the final piece we need for our state machine is an initial state. Um, so this is just a value of our state type. And here we're initializing it to false. So we have our state machine stuff. Now we need to worry about all of the property-based testing stuff. How do we fit all of this together? So how do we generate our inputs? How do we execute them in the um, application? And how do we handle things like shrinking? So before we go much further, there's one um, something I want to consider, which is that all of our inputs in this model are generated before we've executed anything um, against the application. So in our state machine testing, this makes things a little interesting. So in this pretend pseudo code here, if we run our register first input, we have this potential output. We're expecting to get back this token, right? And we're still generating our inputs. We generate another input that we're planning to run, which is a register command. And you'll notice that one of its arguments is this authentication token. So it begs the question now, um, or it kind of highlights that we need some way to talk about our state and the values we're getting back from our application um, before we've actually executed anything against the application. So Hedgehog's solution to this is this var type. Um, so it's a var of some uh, type A and a V. The V is going to be symbolic or concrete. And these are both type constructors. And as you might imagine, a symbolic var is representing some uh, value that we expect to get back from the application while we're executing tests, but we don't actually have a value yet. And likewise, a concrete value is one uh, that we've actually received back from the application, so we have a real value now. Um, this will hopefully become a bit clearer when we start getting to some examples. Um, and so now that we've got all of this uh, behind us, we can start talking about commands. So commands bundle together the generation of our inputs, the execution of the inputs, the preconditions, our state updates, and our post conditions. So, what does that look like? This is an abridged version of the command type from uh, Hedgehog's code. Uh, it's parameterized by an n and an m and a state. The n is our uh, generator monad, the m is the monad in which we get our um, outputs and our state type. So, we need a generator. Our generator will take some symbolic state, so we haven't actually got values back yet. And then it will optionally provide a generator for an input. So it might not make sense to generate um, an input given the state. So as we saw before, if we were looking at generating our register command, it's not going to make sense to generate that input unless we've already run register first and have a token that we need to run this input. Um, we then need to specify how to execute this input. So if we've got a concrete input, um, how do we run that and get an output back from the application? And finally, callbacks. So what do callbacks look like? Um, they're a sum type here. Um, the first constructor is require, which is for preconditions. So if we have a symbolic view of the state and a symbolic input, we need to be able to tell Hedgehog whether or not it makes sense to still run this input. Uh, so this is particularly useful when we're shrinking. You can imagine the case where some uh, input down the line requires an output from earlier um, in our sequence of inputs. Um, and when we're shrinking on, in the event of failure, we may have removed that earlier input, so we no longer have the output in the state that we need to run our future one. So um, this is where the preconditions can help. Uh, next we have updates. So this is how do we update our state. So given um, the old state, the input, and an output, how do I produce a new state? Um, you'll notice here that this isn't symbolic or a parameterized on symbolic or concrete. Um, that's because this update function is used for both symbolic and concrete state updates. So when we're generating our list of inputs that we're going to run against the application, we have a symbolic view, right? We haven't run anything against the application. We don't have values. Everything's symbolic. Likewise, when we're actually executing all of our inputs against the application, we're building up a concrete version of the state. And we want that to be coherent, so we use the same state, uh, sorry, the same update function. And finally, we have our post conditions. So 
Given the old state, the new state, after we've updated, the input and the output, where everything is concrete because everything's been executed now, uh, we can actually um, do something in our test monad and start making some assertions. And the final piece of the puzzle I want to talk about is H-traversable. Um, so this is for higher order traversable functors, which is a bit of a mouthful. Um, so hopefully I can make this, um, explain this, make it a little bit more clear. So um, we've got the traverse from uh, regular old traversable on top and H traverse down the bottom. Um, the regular traverse, we're transforming at the value level. So we're transforming an A to a B with some effect F. In uh, H traverse, we're doing a similar thing, but we're doing it with the type constructors. So you'll see here that we go from a G of A to an H of A with some applicative F. So hopefully make that even clearer, if we start to substitute in some type constructors that we have lying around, we'll see that this gives us a way to take a, an instance of H traversable that is full of symbolic values and produce one um, that is full of concrete values with the option of failure. So if we go back to our inputs where we were ignoring this parameter V, we'll see that if we've got inputs that are full of symbolic values, their arguments are symbolic because we haven't generated any, uh, sorry, haven't executed anything yet. When we go to execute them, we can use this H traverse uh, function to swap the symbolic values for concrete ones that will then allow us to execute them against the application. All right, some examples. So the first one we're going to look at is uh, registering our first property only, uh, only succeeds once. So again, we start with our state, um, as we saw before. Again, we're just using a Boolean flag here to mark whether we've registered our first user or not. And then we need some inputs. So we have a reg first input, which takes our player registration information. Um, and we'll use this input for the success case. And then we have another uh, input, the reg first forbidden. Uh, it's very similar to the first one, except we use this input to test for failures. So once we've registered our first user, we'd also like to make sure that if we try and register that first user again, that we get the appropriate error value um, or the error response. So our commands. Um, our command for register first looks like this. It, as we saw before, it takes a generator, an execute, and um, some callbacks. So what does the generator look like? As we saw before, it takes the symbolic view of the state and then optionally produces um, an input. So it's, as you'd expect, we check if we've registered our first user already. Um, if we have, it doesn't make sense to produce this because we're expecting this to be the success case. Um, and if we haven't registered our first user, then we can produce this input. To execute uh, this particular input, we have our register first function, which comes from servant client. So uh, we use servant to do all of this um, testing, which is kind of incidental to the talk, but has a nice benefit that we get all of these client functions for free. So it makes the testing a lot, a lot easier rather than dealing with some HTTP library. Um, we then pass that to success client. So the type for that's up here. And it takes a servant client environment, a servant client action, and then either returns the error response or the value that we're expecting to get back. We then bind that through to eval either, and that's from hedgehog. And what that does for us is if we have a left uh, value in our either, it will fail the test case and give us a nice um, debugging output, which we'll see later. Um, and again, if we get a success, then it just lifts it up into our monad for us. All right, so the callbacks. So um, this is similar to the logic in the generation. Um, when we're shrinking, we don't want to run this uh, input unless we haven't already registered our first user. Our update's very straightforward. Once we've registered our first user, we just update our flag to true to say that that's what we've done. And then in our post conditions, when we get our actual value back from the application after running this request, um, we're just going to check that our authentication token uh, isn't null or isn't empty and that we have a player ID greater than or equal to zero. Not very interesting, but the properties get more interesting. Um, so forbidden. So this is very similar to uh, the first case, except um, we've switched around the logic in the generator now because we're expecting failure. So if we have registered our first user, we want to try and run that again to make sure we get the right failure. Uh, to execute that, 
Very similar again, except we're using failure client here instead of success client, which is another helper function we've defined which just flips the, the either values around. So now our error values are on the right because that's what we're expecting. And then our callbacks, again, very similar. Uh, we only want to run this if we've already registered our first user. And then in our post conditions, there are no state updates um, because obviously we're not expecting this to change the state. We're expecting to get an error. Um, and in this case, we're expecting a 403. If we don't get a 403, we also want that to be a test failure because if the um, server produced a 500 response, say, um, an error, then that means something's gone horribly wrong. Okay, we're almost there. Register first. So we put this together into our property. Uh, we define our initial state here. So it starts off as false um, because we haven't registered any users yet. Uh, we specify the commands that we want Hedgehog to choose from when it's generating the sequence of commands to run. Uh, we ask Hedgehog to, again, produce that randomly generated list of commands. And then we run a uh, reset action, which resets our application state, and then we go in and execute our commands. So something I want to call out here, which tripped me up when I was first playing with this library, is that my reset action was earlier on um, in this function before I'd finished doing all of the generation of random input, so the call to for all there. And what that meant was that when Hedgehog was shrinking in the event of failure, it wasn't, re it wasn't running my reset action, which meant that I'd get an error, Hedgehog would shrink, it wouldn't run the reset action, and then it would execute the shrink, which meant that my initial state and the application state were no longer in sync, and I would get a totally unrelated error, um, which was very, very confusing until I worked out this was happening. Um, okay, so a quick note on the test setup. Um, I'm not going to go into the details of this because it's kind of incidental, but to make all of this work, we start a temporary database instance. We fork a thread to run our server in using the uh, database instances configuration, and we start that off with a database migration because we want to start off with a fresh, sane schema. And then we run our properties using the uh, servant client environment for the server that we've just kicked off. And now we get to make our hedgehog run and we get a test pass. Not so exciting. What happens if our poor little hedgehog fails, though? There he goes. Um, we won't make him do it again. Not yet, anyway. Um, so to simulate a failure, we're going to change the generator for our register first command. So we're going to tell it that it's always OK to produce this command, um, to register first and expect success. Likewise, uh, in our callbacks for the register first command, we're going to get rid of the precondition, again, because we want to make sure that we can always run this uh, command, rightly or wrongly. So with these modifications, if we run again, we get some pretty error output. Um, and because we're not Mark Hibbard, we even get colors. Um, <laughs> so, um, right, so as I mentioned before in our eval either, um, because we've used this eval either, uh, function, it means that our error output and all of our context here is right where the failure actually occurred, um, which is great. And not only that, but eval either is also printed for us the error value that we got when we were expecting a success. So if you look below, you'll see that it's a failure response, it's a 403, and we've got our message saying that the first user has already been added. Not only that, Hedgehog will also give us this, which is the list of inputs that it shrunk down to to reproduce the failure. So this is a minimal example to reproduce this failure. And not surprisingly, we've registered our first user twice and expected success. All right, so play account. So this is where things get a little bit more interesting. Um, the property that we're testing is that successfully registering a player increments the number of uh, players. So I even have a state machine diagram for this. Pretty straightforward. Um, and so the first change we're going to look at is our state. So you might expect we're keeping a count of things now so we could just use an integer value in our state instead of a bool. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case because all of our register commands uh, require that we have uh, an authentication token for an administrator. So now we need to keep track of those in our state. And those come uh, as outputs from the application itself, which means now we're getting into actually using bars and symbolics and things. 
Um, so as you can see, we've got a player map, which maps their emails to this um, player with RSP value, which we'll have a look at in a sec. And we're also keeping track of the set of admin emails so that we can find these admin tokens that we'll need. Um, so this is our player with RSP type. Um, we're using the vars that we saw earlier. Um, it's storing a, a value of type response player, um, and it's parameterized with this V, so it can be symbolic or concrete. Uh, everything else in this type we know at generation time, so it doesn't need to be wrapped up in a var. Um, it doesn't come back from the, the application. All right, now we can look at our commands. So first cab off the rank is our register first command. So we're still using this command. As you would expect, all of our um, checks where we were checking this Boolean flag have now been switched to checks that our play account is zero or not. Um, and so the most important change is how we're updating the state. So looking at our um, update callback, uh, we combine our registration information with our response from the server and to create our new um, player with RSP value that we're storing in our player map. Uh, we create the singleton map because this is the first user. Likewise, the first user to get registered is always an admin, so we add them to the admins, and then we wrap it up in our new state. Uh, the next command we'll look at is getting the play account. Um, so we need to get this back from the server now to verify that um, we've kept our model up to date. Um, it's not a very interesting input, it's just a nullary constructor here to say that that's the request we'd like to run. Um, the most interesting thing about the play account is obviously the post condition, so when we get the count back from the server, we wanna compare it to the size of our player map and make sure that they agree. Um, and we also have a sanity check in here to make sure that our, the number of players we have is greater than or equal to the number of admins. So just making sure that our state updates um, are working. And the register command. So this is where things get more interesting again. So as we saw before, the register, um, sorry, register input takes the registration information and the player information for an administrator so we can use their token to run this um, against the application. So our generator, um, as you expect, if we don't have any admin users, we can't generate this input. We need that um, administrator token. If we do have an administrator, we can randomly select one from our set of administrators using gen.element from Hedgehog, and then use that to look up our player in our player map. And from there, we can wrap everything up into our register input. To execute, it's very similar to the executes we've seen before, the main difference being that we're pulling our client token out of our administrator player now, because that will form part of the um, request. Um, and then we've got some callbacks, so our precondition here is that uh, if we are shrinking, we need to make sure that our administrator is still an administrator, so the email for that player is still in the administrator's list. And then we have our state update. So this is similar to the register first, except in this case we're inserting into the map rather than producing the singleton. And we also now need to check whether our new player that we've registered is an admin. If they are, we add them into the admins. If not, we um, don't. All right, so wrapping this up into our second property, uh, our initial state's now changed because we have an empty player map and an empty set of admins. And we have a couple of new commands. Otherwise, everything's the same. We run our hedgehog again, and we get success. All right, so our third example here um, is a round trip property. So now we're checking that the data we get back from the server matches what we've entered. Um, we're adding another command here, which is the me command. Uh, its generator is, um, uses this gen player with RSP, which optionally produces a player, depending on whether our player count is greater than zero. Um, and then we use that to produce our, wrap it up with our me. Uh, to execute, as we expected before, um, as we saw before, rather. Uh, the callbacks, so our precondition here is that our player is still a player, um, so we can't get information for a player that doesn't exist. And then we don't have any state updates because we're just retrieving data from the system here, but we have our post conditions, so um, one thing to note is the um, application state stores the admin flag as a Boolean, but when we're registering a player, it's an optional field. And so we have this defaulting logic where we default the admin flag to true. And then we check the rest of our properties, um, sorry, the rest of our values in our player match up. 
but we've made a mistake. Our hedgehog's going to fall over again. <laughs> Poor guy. Um, so yeah, again, we get some really helpful output from uh, hedgehog. We see here that our um, admin um, flag we expected to be true, and actually it was false. Uh, and again, we also get our list of inputs that show us a minimal example after shrinking of how to reproduce this failure. So we register our first user, we register a second user, and then we ask for that user's information, the second user's information, um, and then we get our failure. And we'll see here that our is admin flag was nothing. So it's our defaulting logic has come into play. So if you remember back to our um, callbacks here, our post conditions, we had this defaulting logic to default our admin flag to true when it was nothing. But actually, it should be false, right? Um, which kind of makes sense. You don't want to just assume everyone's an admin. So if we run this again, Hedgehog's happy. We get a success. All right, and that's it. Um, so I've got some references for the talk. Um, our slides will be up soon. Uh, the application's already up on GitHub, so if uh, anything didn't make sense or you missed anything, feel free to check out the code. Um, feel free to come find me on IRC or Twitter or anything I'm not too hard to find. Um, there's Hedgehog on GitHub. Um, I highly recommend checking out the code there. And Tim Humphreys um, had a really good blog post introducing this stuff. And some image credits. Cool, thank you.